to my new YouTube video on private trust companies versus professional trust companies. I'm going to be trying a new setup again today. Uh, we're going to be trying the PowerPoint presentation run off of my iPad with an Apple Pencil so I can draw on here. Uh, so please let me know in the comments section what you guys think about this setup. Uh, I keep trying to fine tune which one of these setups is, is going to be best for presenting videos um, for myself and for you guys. So I really appreciate any feedback. So as most of you guys know, one of the things that I do, it's actually the primary thing that I do, is I work with families to set up what I call wealth structures, right? So this is trusts and foundations to protect their assets, to make sure that there's estate planning for the next generation, to make sure there's proper succession of control, to make sure there's privacy and to make sure that there's all those things that a family would want in a, a, a wealth structure with their estate planning and everything to make sure future generations are, are financially secured and, and obviously obtain some, some tax benefits uh, if possible, which, which they usually are. And so one of the discussions that I have a lot with, with a lot of my clients is who's going to control the trust? Uh, is this going to be controlled by a professional? Is, do, 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 does the client want to maintain control? And there's basically two options for administering a trust, the, the private trust company and the professional trust company. We're going to start off with uh, a little bit of a trust primer to give you guys a background. For those of you who are, are unfamiliar with the parties involved with a trust, we're going to, we're going to go over that. Uh, but before we do that, as always, uh, a little CYA, a disclaimer. This is for educational purposes only. This is not specific tax or legal advice. Uh, if you guys need some specific advice on, on your particular matter, get professional advice. Obviously, we are here to help. So first, like I said, we're going to start off with a little bit of a trust primer, give you guys an idea of who the parties are in a trust. So a trust is actually not an entity contrary to common belief, it's a contract. And it's a contract between the settlor or grantor and the trustee. So the settlor or grantor is normally the person that's gonna be forming the trust, okay? And the settlor or grantor is going to transfer assets to the trustee to be administered for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So a good way to think of this is, if I wanted to form a trust for the benefit of my kids, I would transfer assets to a third party trustee and that third party trustee would then own those assets and administer those assets for the benefit of my kids. In that situation, I'm the settlor or grantor, that third party trustee is obviously the trustee and my kids are the beneficiaries. Now, there's another party that is an option that you can have, which is a protector. And the protector is generally charged with supervising the trustee and also approving certain actions. So for example, uh, and we'll get into the protector more later, but the protector often has the power to like remove the trustee or consent to distributions, th things of that nature. And if you didn't gather it from what I've said already, the trustee is actually considered the legal owner, the, the, the legal, legal title holder of the assets in the trust. And like I said before, you have two options in terms of hiring a trustee. You have a professional trust company, which is basically a company that is in the business of administering trusts. So this is all they, they do. They professionally administer trusts. They normally charge a percentage of the trust assets for doing that. Sometimes you can negotiate flat fees. It depends. This is Professional trust companies are generally very highly regulated, uh, which is good, right? Because they're trusting people. Uh, we, people are entrusting them with, with their money. So there's usually insurance requirements, minimal, minimum capitalization requirements. There's cer certain operational requirements and, and, and safeguards and things like that that have to be in place for, for them to operate. And the other option is a private trust company. A private trust company is essentially a company established by the family that's, that's going to be setting up this trust to specifically administer their trust. And there's, there's generally some exceptions. So they're either 
not regulated or only lightly regulated, but there's usually restrictions for who they can act as a trustee for. So, for example, they'll be limited to acting for a certain family or a certain number of families that can't hold themselves out to be in the business of, of, of being a trustee. But because this is a more intimate relationship, because it's being established by the family, it's presumably being run by the family or trusted advisors of the family, uh, they give some acceptance on, on the regulations because you're not entrusting unknown parties with, with your money. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of a trust company, so I mean, obviously one of the big ones is control, right? So if you have a private trust company, if, if you're the settler, for example, you can establish a private trust company and you can elect yourself to the board, you can elect other family members to the board, you can elect your lawyer or other trusted advisors to the board. So you have much greater control. You're not entrusting your assets to, to a third party. You also have control of succession of control, right? So you can have provisions built in to say how the board of directors of this, this PTC are going to be replaced, what the qualifications are, right? So you can have minimal education, you know, minimum education or, or, or um, like experience requirements, for example. Uh, the other really nice thing is it's optimized for the family that it serves, right? Because the PTC is only serving one family, it's highly customized for that family. So they're getting exactly what they want. Finally, you have privacy, right? Because you have control of all your information. Whereas if you're using a professional trustee, you kind of lose that privacy because you're entrusting this, this third party with, with you know, very sensitive information. Also, you can make much more rapid commercial decisions because this is your team that's focused on your family stuff. Whereas when you're using a professional trustee, they probably have uh, very specific risk tolerances and a decision-making process that can take a lot, a lot longer. Uh, you also have uh, lower operating costs for significant wealth. Um, so as I was saying before, professional trustees often charge a percentage of the value of, of the trust to administer it. And if you have hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, that's obviously going to get quite expensive and a trust company is, a private trust company is going to make a lot of sense. But there are some disadvantages to private trust companies that a lot of people really underestimate. So the first is it's complex to set up, right? So you need to go through what powers the trustee is going to have, how the board's going to be replaced, who can serve, what the decision-making process is. So there's really a lot of thought into this. The, the, there's a lot of thought that needs to go into this. It's also management intensive, right? So whoever's going to be on the board of directors of this thing is going to have to devote significant enough time to it to be able to fulfill their job duties, right? And so this also makes sure is, is making sure that you know the board minutes are properly done and board meetings are done and all of these things which take up time and they need to be properly documented so you have proper corporate governance. And it's also compliance intensive and this kind of goes back to what I was saying is you have to make sure that all the corporate governance is in order, you're, you're following good corporate governance and that does take a lot of work especially if it's an active private trust company and in certain countries, certain jurisdictions, there's actually compliance requirements that are required vis-a-vis -vis the government. So there's certain filing requirements that you have to report to the government on that you're complying with, with these various requirements. For example, like anti-money laundering laws and things like that. Otherwise, you know, it, it can be problematic. Um, and so because of this management that's required, because of the compliance requirements, there is a higher risk that it's going to be improperly administered, that the trust will be improperly administered, which can cause a lot of problems, right? I mean, that can jeopardize the asset protection. It can jeopardize a, a lot of the different benefits that you're getting from the trust and, and potentially have it declared a sham or an alter ego or something like that, in which case, you know, the, the, the trust really served no purpose. There's also potential tax disadvantages, right? So if you, if so, somebody has to own this private trust company and depending on where they live, uh, this could have certain tax consequences. So for example, if the PTC was owned by a U.S. person and the PTC was located in a foreign country, it would probably be a controlled foreign corporation. You'd have subpart F issues, you'd have guilty issues, you'd have a bunch of tax filing requirements. 
It's another thing to think about. You also have the economic substance regulations, which have been enacted in most low and no tax countries at this point, which require the core income generating activities of the company to be taking place in that country. So, so the country where the PTC is located. So this means you know, the board of directors either needs to be traveling there to, to, to make these decisions and to manage the company, or you need people on the ground, which isn't always so easy to find in island jurisdictions. It's much easier to find professionals to properly manage a PTC in some place here like Dubai, where we have a, a, a big competent workforce. Um, finally, like I was saying, you do have potential uh, estate planning issues with who's going to own the PTC next. So let's say the settler, the guy that set up the trust, he sets up the PTC and he owns it. Well, who's going to own it when he dies, right? You, have, you sort of have your own uh, estate planning issues that go along with the PTC. Now, obviously, I have some solutions for that, but I'm just making you aware of, of this potential pitfall. And secondly, you have a high setup cost uh, to get not just the actual setup of the PTC, but all the planning that goes into making sure that it's going to operate the way you want it to. So those kind of should give you a good overview of what the advantages and disadvantages of a PTC are. So now let's take a look at what a professional trust company has to offer. So one of the biggest advantages of, of the professional trust company is there's no complex setup, right? It's a plug and play solution. You sign a contract with, with, with the um, professional trust company, you're ready to go. You can be assured that your trust is going to have proper administration because that's all these, these professional trust companies do. So you have a lot more confidence that it's not going to be improperly managed and, and therefore jeopardizing some of the benefits that come along with the trust. You, you know you're going to have basically no management because the, the, the professional trust company is going to do that. You know that the compliance is going to be taken care of because they're going to be handling that. You have no tax disadvantages because you're not going to own the trustee. It's its own separate business, completely separate from the settler. You're not going to have estate planning issues with the trustee because, again, you're not going to own it. It's a separate business. Uh, because it's in the because the professional trust company is in the business of being a trustee, it's automatically going to take care of its own economic substance issues. You're going to have greater asset protection because you're not going to have control. You're not going to be at risk of improper administration, stuff like that. And there's no setup cost, right? It's a plug and play solution. The disadvantage, obviously the big one that everybody focuses on is the loss of control. Everybody wants to have control of their assets, right? Which I don't blame them. Uh, it's also not optimized for the family it serves, right? So it's a business that has to serve to the needs of many clients. So there's generally some pretty rigid processes and procedures that need to be complied with, and including decision-making processes and stuff like that. So you're going to have a much more rigid institution behind this that's not going to make things as easy as if you had a a professional trust company. So like I said, you have, you'll, you have a loss of privacy because you're going to be entrusting a third party with a lot of uh, your sensitive financial information. You can have slower commercial decisions. Uh, the, the private trust, uh, sorry, professional trust companies are generally more risk averse. So if the trust is likely not, the professional trust is likely not going to want to make any sort of risky uh, investments because they're not going to want to be responsible for it. And you're going to have high ongoing uh, costs if it's significant net worth that's in the, in the trust because again the fee is generally a percentage. So now comes the question that my clients always want to ask me, right? Which one's better? Uh, and like all answers that I have to give clients, unfortunately the answer is it depends. Um, like I was saying, people really like the private trust company mostly because of the control that it offers them. They don't want to entrust their assets to a, a third party. But like I was saying before, there's really a lot that goes into properly managing a private trust company. You have to have proper corporate governance, properly proper policies and procedures in place. Sometimes there's regulatory compliance. You have to make sure there's proper accounting for the trust, that the board meetings and resolutions are taken care of. And that there's reporting done to the stakeholders, right? So the beneficiaries, the settler, everybody that, that has a stake in this trustee. So 
this requires really a team of competent professionals that you need to install to properly operate this private trust company because improperly managing the private trust company can jeopardize all the benefits of the trust. So if you're willing to properly fund the private trust company and dedicate the resources to hiring and training the professionals that you're going to need to properly manage it, then it's definitely an option, but that takes a lot of work and a lot of money to do properly. So here's my recommendation. If the net worth that's going to go into the trust is under 50 million, generally I prefer the professional trust company because I think that they're going to do a better job and I think it becomes cost, starts becoming cost prohibitive to properly manage a, a private trust company. If you have a, a net worth of more than 50 million that you're going to put into the trust, then I think the private trust company starts to be more viable, right? Because it becomes actually less expensive than a professional trustee would be. And it makes sense to dedicate the resources of that, at, at that net worth to operate your own private trust company, which can double often as, as a sort of a family office or be closely tied to the family office. Now there is an alternative that I think a lot of people miss that I think is a nice balance between uh, the professional trustee and the private trust company, which is the protector, right? So as I said at the beginning of this presentation, the protector can be given certain powers. So the protector's role within the trust is that of sort of a supervisory position of the trustee. And they generally can have certain powers vis-a-vis -vis the trustee. So they usually have the power to remove and replace the trustee. So if the trustee isn't doing the job, isn't properly performing, the protector has the power to remove them and replace them. They can also, you can also grant the protector the power to approve distribution. So basically the trustee can't make a distribution without the approval of the trustee. You can even put in there, I've seen trusts, for example, where if there's going to be an expenditure above a certain amount that that requires uh, trustee supervision, you, or sorry, protector consent. You can have it that the protector has to consent to redomiciling the trust or terminating the trust or amending the trust. So you can really put a good safeguard in there with a protector provision. You don't want to make the power so great that, that the trustee is sort of impeded from being able to do their job because that's not going to be good. It could be viewed that the protector potentially is, is, is the trustee. But I think, it, I think it's a really good option for people. And a lot of times, especially if you're going with the professional trustee, you can usually have the settler be the protector, right? So that's going to give them a high degree of control still over the trustee because they could remove them. They would have to approve the distributions. So the trustee is not really going to be able to do anything really adverse to, to their interests. You could also have a family member or a trusted advisor or even a professional trust company or law firm or something like that act as a protector. So I generally think that uh, a well-drafted protector provision coupled with a professional trustee is sufficient for most people. Uh, private trust companies are really good if you need to maintain that control and you want you know, dedicated, customized service specific to your family and you have the resources to properly fund it. Uh, private trust companies are also sometimes a necessity if the trust is invested in high risk assets because a professional trustee isn't really going to want to take the risk and, and liability in case one of those goes south. Anyway, those are my thoughts on private trust companies versus professional trust companies. I hope that you find this really useful and that this aids you know, many potential people out there that are considering setting up a trust that gives some guidance as to you know, what might be the right way for them to go in terms of the administration and management of their trust. This is one of the questions that I get most from my clients who are, are, are new to setting up trusts and uh, I certainly hope this helps. Uh, if you need any help figuring this out, you can contact us. Contact information is right here. Have a great day. Peace.